Do you like open worlds? Escaping to somewhere new? Adventure and stories you'll never forget? Keep watching. Welcome heroes to the adventure of a lifetime. Before long, your ears will be ringing with the clash of swords and your eyebrows will be singed by explosive fireballs. But first, there's something you need to know. You might have heard of Dungeons and Dragons and always wondered if it was for you. And I'm here to tell you that it absolutely is. Dungeons and Dragons is a storytelling game played with friends where you decide what happens next in a fantasy world of swords and swords sorcery. Every success or failure along your journey is a mix of skill, story, and a roll of the dice. So if you've ever heard of D&D, or even if you haven't, this video will give you a glimpse into a whole new world. First of all, D&D is about story, but you're not just listening, you're part of the adventure. Have you ever watched a TV show and thought it should have ended differently? Have you ever read a book and disagreed with what a character did? Have you ever played a video game and wanted an option beyond fight or run? D&D is your chance to take control and make those choices. You decide what happens next and the dice help you along. You are limited only by you and your friend's imagination. Fighting through huge battles in vast open plains, exploring jungles to find ancient treasures, rising up against a corrupt monarch, even becoming said monarch. You can play any story you like, anywhere and any way you want to. If you can think of it, you can do it, or at least try to. Believe it or not, you already know about it. If you've ever leveled up a character or used a health potion in a video game, that's D&D. If you've enjoyed the twisting story of an epic fantasy TV show, that's D&D. If you've ever watched a movie where a group of unlikely heroes team up to bring down an overwhelming evil, that's D&D. It's not something totally new and scary. It's already in your head and your heart. In D&D, you can be anyone, anything. You can transform who you are. Be tall, short, purple hair, purple horns. You can breathe underwater, breathe fire, or you could just be you in a cooler outfit. Play as a tiny gnome with a giant hammer, a half-orc who shreds on the loot, or a goblin who talks their way out of every situation. You can try anything and truly express yourself. Practice things you're not good at in real life. Rally together an entire army, even though you hate public speaking. Take down a cyclops with your bare hands, even though you can't do a single press up. Or befriend a huge bear, even though your landlord said no pets. D&D can be a place to escape to, or a place for self-improvement. D&D is a chance to explore how you would react. An ancient red dragon is looming over you, about to rain down fire. Will you use a sword to hack your way to victory? Weave a spell to outwit the monster? Or try your hand at romance with an alluring ballad? And see if it's interested. The point is, the decision is yours, and D&D is almost limitless. Dungeons & Dragons is a game played with friends. It's a chance to socialize, share some dwarven ales, roll some dice, and enjoy spending time with your nearest and dearest. In D&D, you're constantly interacting, bouncing off each other and experiencing weird and wondrous things together. Are you always talking about that time a mate climbed a tree and couldn't get down? About the time your tent got flooded on a camping trip? In D&D, you and your friends will be creating awesome memories that you'll cherish forever. Apart from the time they fed your last healing potion to a dog. Yes, it might all be in your imagination, but taking down a hydra with your buddies is something you'll be able to relive with your friends for years to come. If you're watching this and thinking, nice try, but I'll never get enough friends to commit to it. Well, D&D is a great way to find people who will. It's easy to meet them by joining a local group and sharing your interests. Before you know it, you'll be making those unforgettable memories with new, equally passionate friends. 
So now you know why you should be playing D&D. It's fun, it's freeing, and hopefully you're already imagining yourself as an elven archer or axe-wielding dwarf. If you're ready to take the next steps, then head to the website to learn more. All the links you need are in the description. So, what are you waiting for? Become someone new, live an incredible story, and do it all with your best friends in tow. Hello and welcome back after that very interesting video. We are joined by Greg and Shelley from the Dungeons and Dragons podcast. It's like being with royalty here. So, hello guys, how are you today? Good, We're how are wonderful. you doing? Great. Not bad. Um, much better now this is underway. So, Greg, I saw your face <laughs> light up when you noticed you were on screen a few minutes earlier. Are you used to being on screen or are you mainly uh, just audio with the podcast there? We've done a lot of uh, streaming of the podcast in the past of Dragon Talk, uh, as well as playing, you know, Dungeons and Dragons on live streams. That's been a huge uh, thing as technology has caught up uh, with D&D uh, &D play. Uh, and yeah, I know, used to being on camera a little bit. <laughs> Perfect. And Shelley, have you been doing much on Zoom? I think most people's jobs are on Zoom at the moment, aren't they? Yes, yes. Lots of lots of time on Zoom and and like Greg uh, with the podcast, we're, we're, uh, we record that as well and um, for our YouTube audience. But you probably also saw us going like this a lot watching that video because it's I love that video. It's just it it really captures so well what uh, D and D is and and how it impacts people's lives so positively. Yeah, it definitely helps to inspire our young people when the leaders are like. So you are obviously here to talk about D and D. Um, would you like to start and tell us, you know, what is Dungeons and Dragons um, and what does it also mean to you guys? Uh, so, I mean, in a nutshell, uh, Dungeons and Dragons is playing pretend with your friends uh, around a table. Uh, you know, I think every kid has an experience of doing that and uh, coming up with scenarios and games with their with their friends. D&D uh, &D does that. It just provides a little bit more of a framework for uh, resolving actions that you take in the game and the choices that you make. So if you want to uh, jump across a chasm uh, to save your friend, you might have to roll a d20 and determine whether or not you get all the way across. Uh, but other than that, it's just about, you know, getting together and telling stories, uh, which is something that, you know, humans have been doing as long as we've been humans. Uh, and D&D uh, &D just provides a framework for doing that, especially during, uh, during this time when everyone's in quarantine. Great, great. Yeah. So um, you guys host the podcast. Shelley, would you like to start um, by telling us what you do with Dungeons and Dragons alongside the podcast and anything else um, generally to do with the game? Yeah, so uh, my day job is I am the brand manager for the Dungeons and Dragons tabletop role playing game. So um, I get to work really closely with all of our teams to um, help bring Dungeons and Dragons to our audiences. I you know, work with our social media teams, with Greg on communications, with our web team, um, with the story development team. And it's just, um, it's, it's hard to imagine a better day job because you know, we are working with people who have become such close friends, mostly because we play a lot of D&D &D together. Um, Greg and I also co-host, as you mentioned, Dragon Talk, which is the official Dungeons and Dragons podcast. We've been doing that together for about was it five or six years now. Five years, um, yeah. Five years, yeah. And actually, we're um, we are going to be writing a book together um, about Dragon Talk and about how Dragon Talk has helped really shine a light on some of our um, the amazing community members, the people that we interview uh, on Dragon Talk. We talk to a lot of uh, content creators, but also actors, directors, um, writers, novelists therapists, um, just, you know, people who, who use D and D in really creative ways. And also people who credit D and D with getting them to, uh, where they are in their lives today. Yeah. And I'm sure that book will be really interesting just to see, you know, everything else that goes on behind dragon talk. I'm sure, you know, everyone only hears what goes out to air, but, um, so I'm behind the scenes sometimes. And I know that a lot more happens than, you know, what everyone else sees. So, um, Greg, what do you do with D and D alongside drag, uh, dragon talk? So I'm, uh, as Shelley mentioned, I'm communications manager. So that's about getting, uh, the messages about what makes D and D great 
uh, for, you know, for kids, for adults, for everyone uh, out there in the, the greater sphere. You know, that is, you know, PR. So working with uh, editors and journalists, you may have seen a lot of stories uh, popping up over the last five years uh, in all types of, of media from, from the UK as well as uh, around the world. And uh, that's all me. No, that's me and a, and a wonderful team of people who are uh, <laughs> communicating with all those editors and making sure that they have everything that they need in order to uh, get that story out there. Uh, in addition, I like to working with the community, uh, as, as uh, Shelley mentioned, and uh, identifying, you know, creators and folks who uh, are even better proselytizers of what makes D&D great than, than me or, or Shelley can do. Uh, and uh, that's been really, really gratifying, just working with this huge cross section of different people from, you know, uh, all walks of life, um, which is which is a really important tenet for for what Dungeons and Dragons is all about. It's it's if you if you think about the uh, classic D and D party of uh, you know a, a fighter and a wizard and a rogue and a cleric all coming together to solve problems together, well, in some ways, I feel the D and D community is like that, where you have people from you know uh, all over the world from different backgrounds coming together uh, to uh, just you know tell these great stories together, and so uh, that's that's a real big lift when I can do that uh, in my role as communications manager. That is great. And it must be so nice to um, almost be in contact with the people, not only who are playing Dungeons and Dragons, but people who might not have uh, be able to, you know, help with that outreach. And you actually get across, you know, a, a wide range of people. So it must be very rewarding. I'm quite jealous of that. Um, so, <laughs> of course, Dungeons and Dragons, we've said slightly what it is, but would you like to tell us part of the origin story um, and go, you know, all the way back? Because it's, it's a few a few years old now. Uh, I've certainly heard of it since I was a kid and I'm still quite young, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. I mean, I mean, it's been around for 46 years, uh, you know, first published in 1974. Um, and it is uh, this offshoot from from uh, actually tabletop war gaming. Um, and it is evolved way more past that. So I don't, I don't want to focus too much on, on, on what Dungeons and Dragons was and where it came from. But like where it is now is uh, something that allows people to uh, express themselves and tell stories, feel like heroes, and uh, accomplish, you know, uh, tasks. Even just like in that video we just saw of like de you know defeating a, a tyrannous leader or uh, you know saving a, a society from an attack by mind flayers. All these types of things you don't really get to do in your normal life, uh, most of us. And so being able to jump into that and do uh, you know have have those feelings of adrenaline you know there's lots of pressure sometimes you know it all hinges on what a die roll will end up being if you can if you can make the right choices or or uh, have the great successes um, you know we've many of the themes from uh, talking to all the people on Dragon Talk is that those moments those imaginary moments that they have around the table are the things that they share with their friends for for years to come and you can be like oh man remember 15 years ago when we defeated that dragon and and uh and it, those memories become almost more uh powerful and stronger than than the real memories in their in their real lives and so uh that's the stuff that makes dungeons and dragons just really special and different than any other game out there that's great and so shelly we've talked we talked about you know the origin of dungeons and dragons itself but what what's your origin story how did you come to be you know known with the game how did you get playing and how, how did you start campaigns so i started working at wizards of the coast about 20 years ago i know it seems like i'm much too young to have been working 20 <laughs> years ago but uh i was and i actually started working on magic the gathering that was um what my original job was i knew wizards had pub was publishing dungeons and dragons I didn't know anything about it. And quite honestly, I was just going to leave that to those role players. That wasn't my thing. Um, I didn't, you know, want to, I thought it was very high fantasy and I, you know, didn't fancy myself a fantasy fan. I thought that it, you know, like you had to have costumes and accents and like, I, that's just not for me. Um, so for years, I kind of stayed away from it. And then I eventually got a new job working on the D&D team. And my boss was like, you know, you're going to have to learn how to play D&D &D now. And I'm like, mm, yeah, <laughs> you know, whatever, we'll, we'll get to that, sure. Um, there was a few other new people on the team. So they decided to put us together in a group and teach us how to play D&D. And I remember building my first character with my dungeon master. And it felt like a lot of numbers and, and math. And you know, like he was very, very thorough. And then he said to me, what do you want to name her? 
and I said, name her. I'm like, oh, okay. Astrid. I'm going to name my character Astrid. And from that moment, it just kind of clicked with me. Like, this is me. You know, this is a way cooler version of me. And we had our first game together and we were all very, very nervous. But the dungeon master just, you know, asked us, gave us a little background and said, what do you want to do? And then it, we just took it from there. And I remember within minutes we were laughing and we were talking and we were coming up with these crazy ideas and the story just started to unfold around us. And I thought after two hours, it, you know, it flew by and I was, you know, disappointed that this, the game was actually ending. I'm kind of mad at myself for not trying it a little bit sooner, but I realized this is it. This is just storytelling. This is just making up tales with these great, wonderful, creative people. And that group and I became very, very close. I mean, we, we were just coworkers at that time, but we played that game together for two years every week dedicated. I mean, we had one of our party members was actually went into labor during one of our games and she was like, it's fine. Just keep going, keep going. Like we're, we're in the middle of a fight and it's going to be fine. And then another one who, a guy who played the cleric in our game, he actually was the officiant at, at my wedding. Um, so, you know, we became, everybody was still, you know, and we still are very, very close together. And that's one of the most special things to me about D and D is knowing how these friendships can form because of these games. And like Greg said, because of the experiences that you share around the table, it just, if a lot of those, you had to be there moments. Um, but there's, there are stories that you're, you're going to tell for years and years and years. That's wonderful. And it really sounds like, you know, you've, you've started off with a game that was a job and now it's become a life and you've got family from it. So, you know, there's nothing really more to complain about that. Um, I must uh, make an admission here. I've never played Dungeons and Dragons. I first heard about it from the Big Bang Theory TV show. That's how embarrassing it is. Um, so you mentioned that you chose your character name uh, throughout your times playing different campaigns and different games. Do you have the same character or do you bring them through? Um, we'll start off with Shelley here and then I'll come to you. You, Greg. So um, I played Astrid for um, about two and a half years because she was my first character. I was very um, protective of her and I don't think I let her have as much fun as she probably could have. She probably could have handled more, but uh, she was a sorceress and I made her stand back a lot. Like a lot of her, her spells are, are ranged anyway, so she could cast a magic missile from miles and miles away. But uh, <laughs> I, the next... I kind of tucked her away like she survived all that and I was very happy that she did and she she's always you know you never forget your first D&D character but I've made lots of characters since then and I mean everything from a minotaur to um, I don't typically I don't play a lot of clerics because I'm not really good in emergencies and, and they're the ones that you have to call in case you need <laughs> healing uh, not good but I do like to play a lot of magic users so I play some some warlocks some wizard some some sorceresses um lately i've been dabbling as a, a ranger because i got really into the hunger games and i thought that might be fun to have a bow and arrow but that's the thing about D D. you can you know try out many different uh personalities if there's something that that you you like uh, from pop culture from books from tv there's probably a way that you can incorporate some of that into D D and just experience it for yourself Perfect. And then, Greg, so do you have a first character that you've brought through with you up until now, or do you have a, a new favorite character that you have? Um, I mean, as Shelley said, I was, uh, uh, my first character is one that I'll never really kind of forget. It was a uh, half-elf ranger. Uh, I was uh, taken with Aragorn and uh, Tannis Half-Elven from the Dragonlance series of books, and so I wanted to make uh, a character like that, and uh, this was in the uh, you know, a, a previous edition of Dungeons and Dragons, and I think I got up to level 22 with that character wow. uh, uh, over the course of playing over two or three years uh, with this uh, amazing group in New York City. Um, but you know, that, that's that's one that I'll always hold uh, really near and dear, and that's uh, and a fun trope. And I do like being able to be in the background and shoot arrows and, and just do a lot of damage and, <laughs> and do some like Legolas type moves as well. Uh, yeah. Those are super fun. Um, but I know as far as you know, new characters now. One of my favorites is, is Daryl Two Shoes, which is a uh, yeah. a brother to uh, Shelley's character. Uh, they're both uh, Tabaxi, which is a uh, you know half person, half cat 
uh, like of uh, species and uh, you know they, they were litter mates and uh, they've just got reunited uh, on a uh, wonderful story that we play uh, basically in the last five minutes of every episode of our podcast we'll do a short session of what is happening between Daryl Two Shoes and and uh, uh, and uh, and Shelley's character, uh, so super fun. Uh, and as 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 we've kind of said in these comparisons here, uh, using favorite uh, uh, characters or tropes from other forms of, of fantasy media is a great way to uh, inspire the kind of characters that you want to do. So if you if you love Gandalf uh, from Lord of the Rings, you know maybe a wizard is something that you might want to try. Uh, if you like uh, the big burly. Um, fighters you know maybe uh uh you know arnold schwarzenegger's conan is something that you might want to use as an as an emulation uh and and all that types of stuff and so those types of uh, inspirations end up making uh you know mixing with your own personality as well as what's going on in the group uh to create uh something something new and, and really fun that uh is is memories for years to come that's great. So we have a few minutes before we're going to go to some questions from our viewers. Um, but you guys are, of course, the D&D podcast Dragon Talk hosts. So for any of our um, watchers, our viewers or listeners out there who haven't listened to the podcast before or don't really know anything about it, um, Shelley, could you give me a, a, a quick introduction to it? What can they expect? Is this kind of tutorials? Is this D&D talk? Is it campaigns? What, what happens in the podcast? So Dragon Talk, uh, being the official Dungeons and Dragons podcast, as we mentioned, it is um, Greg and I, usually, we, we do one feature interview for every episode, and then there's always um, a segment that complements that. So the feature interviews, like we said, are with um, people from the D&D community that range from like Hollywood actors that you've seen in um, some of the biggest box office movies out there to animators, to writers, to directors, to um, therapists that like to use D&D as part of their practice, to teachers, to educators, those are some of my favorites, to um, hearing how they like to incorporate D&D into the classroom, um, to just, you know, people who are, uh, are live streamers, people who are creating some just really great content. And the goal is to shine a spotlight on these people and to help build their audiences as well. A lot of times um, there's a lot of people that maybe uh, don't have as big of an audience and the work that they're doing really deserves to be elevated. Um, we want to see more of, of a, our diverse community represented and this is a great way for us to um, help those people get their work seen. That's yeah, great. And then, the so, segments. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes. No, no, you, you, you go ahead, definitely. I was going to say, I, one of the things that I instituted in the, in the podcast was creating these segments where we get to talk to some of the D&D creators. Uh, so Chris Perkins is a, a story designer. So uh, we often talk to him on a segment called Lore You Should Know, which is uh, about talking the, uh, you know, the, the, the background and history and lore behind some of the fantastical worlds that D&D is set in. And those are really great. I like to, uh, I, I'm the interviewer there and I like to make me uh, put myself in the, in the shoes of the audience members who may not know all these things and ask the questions and pull out something that's really great seeing hearing the creators talk about that as well as uh, sage advice which is uh, me speaking to jeremy crawford who is the lead rules developer for dungeons and dragons about the philosophy behind why certain uh rules or spells or things were described in certain ways and that's really great to uh get a you know a more firmer understanding of how to uh, run uh, what's happening? I, I kind of think of that as a as an ancillary to the books themselves, uh, and uh, that can be really interesting for a lot of folks. And then Shelley has a great segment on uh, uh, how to DM, uh, where she talks to uh, dungeon masters who who run the game and, and uh, special techniques or ways that they can do to involve more players or uh, you know overcome certain challenges uh, that uh, they face when dungeon mastering. And those have been really great to educate. Uh, the audience about what's happening there. And then, of course, we also just make sure everyone knows about what's happening with the latest Dungeons & Dragons uh, releases or books that are coming out or new fun things, uh, initiatives, charities, uh, and or uh, things like, uh, you know, this program with, uh, with the Scouts, which we're really proud of. Yeah. That's great. Um, so thank you very much for telling us about the podcast. It sounds really interesting. And certainly I'm going to try and, you know, find some episodes and have a listen and, you know, just find out what what this hype is all about because uh, you you guys are definitely selling it to me so now if you don't <laughs> mind we're going to go on to some questions from our audience we have some very eager yeah. people here so um firstly i have william here and uh they ask 
I got Dungeons & Dragons for Christmas, but there are a lot of rules to read. Do you guys have any pointers for a newbie? So, uh, Chris, I'll start off with you there. You, oh, Greg. Chris? <laughs> oh, sorry, my, my apologies, Greg. I'm reading too many things here. <laughs> Greg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, one thing that I, I mean, that's, that's a common thing that uh, people who are new to the game kind of realize there's, there's three core rule books. Uh, there's a lot of material, but you don't need to know every single rule uh, exhaustively in order to play the game. I think the way I described it earlier on uh, is really the only basic thing you need to know, like that uh, the dungeon master sets the, the scene and lets people uh, know what is what is happening, what their senses are, are hearing. Uh, and then the players get to decide how they're going to uh, act. And uh, the basic thing is just rolling a d20 to find out if you succeed or not. Um, so there is a uh, you know basic rule set on the Dungeons and Dragons website that it's available to download completely for free. Uh, and that is... Uh, also lets you know kind of the, the the real ways to just get into the game as quickly as possible and 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 play it and uh, there's always going to be someone at the table or uh, who who can help out with any specific rule if you can't remember it or recall it right away um, but we also like to tell people like it's okay just to make it up and and mm -hmm. and come up with the way to uh, get through a specific challenge at the table um, and it always ends up being uh, uh, fun so there's there's no way. You know, I, people often think of those things as a, as a blocker, but I, for me, those are just uh, things that will add to your game and make it better. But at the, you really only need to know uh, the basics on how to, um, uh, you know, get get people uh, interested in playing. Yeah, I didn't I can, really explain that like, very well, but go ahead, Shelly. I think you did. <laughs> I think you did great, and I I would like to just add to that that um, the rules, and that is something that is very much associated with D and D when we publish books that are called rule books um but like greg said it's really not important especially when you are just learning D. &D. i remember talking to people who, who who whose job it is to write those rules and they actually said to me don't worry about it and i'm like that's weird because that is your job but okay um don't worry <laughs> about it and you really like it is a game of make-believe and a lot of people's origin stories when we ask them on dragon talk how did you get started playing they always say we had no idea what we were doing and we had the best time so just open up the box pull out the character sheets start rolling dice and just see what happens and also watch some live streams watch people who who are playing DD, &D, and you'll get the idea of of what it's like to like you know just tell a story and take turns and when to roll dice and things like that but overall it's your game you get to make make it up however you like that's great and that's really um, following on from that max, max asks um uh so I, I know you said it is make make believe and do what you want but uh, max asks is is there an adventure book that you would recommend um for beginners that's sort of you know an easier level that really helps guide you into it yeah we published a starter set which is is great for this purpose. The There are character sheets that are in it that are already filled out. So you can just be like, I feel like I want to play a fighter and you can just pull out that character sheet and go. The adventure is really intro friendly. So for a new dungeon master, it's kind of just open the book and start reading it. Um, so that is a wonderful uh, place for you to start. There's also the D&D Essentials Kit, which I, I like a lot as well. Um, that gives rules for one-on-one -on -one play so if you're like, I don't really have a lot of people, I don't have a group yet, then the Essentials Kit might be a great place for you to start. Yeah, the Essentials Kit we came out with uh, in the last few years, and that one uh, I like as a, as a Dungeon Master because it, it actually is similar to the setup of a lot of video games. So when you start into like starting up a story, uh, you might have a quest board uh, in, in, in some you know common video games, and that's similar to how it's set up in the, in the start of the Essentials Kit, where you go into a town, and here's some jobs that you can do. And those are essentially quests that send you to locations. Uh, and it, I find it is a lot easier for uh, folks who have some background in, in digital gaming uh, to be able to uh, translate that directly into the into the D&D &D play. That's great, that's great. So um, across there, you guys, um have mentioned that there's different types of characters that you can play. Do, uh, do you both have a favorite type of character that you play, Shelley? Well, I do like magic users, like the wizards, sorcerers, warlocks. I just like to cast spells and I like to blow things up. 
So that in <laughs> fantasy, not in real life. <laughs> but yep. to me, that's just Need to clarify fun. That. I, you know, yeah, yeah. I just, it's just, it's so far removed from anything that I could ever do in my real life that I just, I just love that. So anything, anyone who can cast spells is, is attractive to me. That's great. And then Greg, do you have a favorite type of character that you uh, prefer playing? Uh, I also like magic users, uh, as uh, Shelley's saying, but one that is special to my heart is, is called a bard, uh, and they're more of an entertainer. Uh, and you know, so my background, I played, uh, uh, I was a stand-up comedian. I've done some uh, some theater and some other things like that. And so having a fantasy character that has some of those um, uh, skills like performance and entertainment uh, is always super fun. And uh, you know, one of the characters I made in the last couple of years was named Terran Zay and he was a uh, uh, a, a dual wand wielding rock star I guess uh, <laughs> he, he uses his wands as microphones similar to uh, Dumbledore in, uh, in, uh, in in Harry Potter uh, to amplify his voice and he you know kind of shreds and creates illusion magic that has uh, flashing lights and all types of light shows uh, all around him to uh, entertain the people of Waterdeep, and so that has been a really fun character, uh, you know, modeled on some of the the glam rock, uh, uh, you know, icons from the '70s and '80s. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that, what we're hopefully we're trying to get across here. There's a huge breadth of different characters uh, and tropes and things that you can play with uh, with all these character classes. But the Bard is definitely one of my favorites. That's great, that's great. So next up um, from Seth, I have a question that says, is Dungeons and Dragons similar to Warhammer? My school has a Warhammer club, but I still really like the look of D&D. Do you think I would like D&D? Is it similar to Warhammer? They're both uh, fantasy and or sci-fi properties um, and uh, their origins were actually kind of similar, especially in the UK. So, uh, you know, the uh, Games Workshop actually was a, um, a store, I believe, in the UK uh, that started, uh, you know, making their own uh, stories around there. So they have a, you know, a, a similar divergent path. But Warhammer, as far as I understand, I'm not a player myself, but that's much more of a uh, competitive game where two players have, uh, you know, different armies and they can, you know, almost like a chess. Um, Dungeons and Dragons is a cooperative game, uh, and that's very, I mean, you know, we hopefully you've gotten that message across here that you're working together with your friends. Uh, to take down an evil. And so it is, uh, you know, a lot more about problem solving and working with, um, uh, you know, the people at the table to uh, come up with a solution or an, a, a, a course of action that could, um, you know, hopefully defeat whatever the Dungeon Master's challenges uh, that, are, that are set before you. So fundamentally, they're very different. Uh, and they have a, a little bit of a, a different aesthetic um, to each one of them, but if you're interested in, uh, you know, telling stories with your friends, Dungeons and Dragons is definitely the way to go. That's great. That's great. So you mentioned, of course, it, it is teamwork. It is with your friends. You're having a lot of fun. You're all playing the campaign together. Aiden asks, um, do you know where I might be able to find any groups that I can play with if there aren't any that I know of? Uh, Shelley, perhaps? So um, that's an excellent question a lot and it's a little bit harder it's a little bit challenging um during the this current pandemic because you're not able to just walk into your local game shop um, but when things do reopen game shops are a great place um, libraries public libraries are also uh, a lot of times they have a space and um for D, &D play and encourage that sort of play happening there uh, as a response to the global pandemic, we started virtual play weekends, which once a month we um, host this uh, virtual play where people can get together and sign up for uh, a table. We have the dungeon masters ready and waiting and standing by. If you have a preference for um, like you like to play on Zoom or Discord or I mean, everything's virtual, so you have to choose one of these platforms, but there is um, a, a table a table for you and you can come with friends you can be solo and just just find you can even you know potentially find a group that you know you bonded with and want to keep playing with um even after that particular weekend we even have intro tables so um to answer i think i don't remember whose question it was but about you know learning how to play this is also a, a great place for you to to learn how to play just you know jump into one of these tables and um those dungeon masters will will tell you everything that you need to know. So um, I would say currently 
probably a virtual play weekend is uh, a great place to get started. Or I don't know if, if in the UK you have things that are equivalent to um, like meetup. Um, but if you know, stay safe, stay virtual. And um, the, I bet if you put the word out that you're looking for people to play D and D, you will be surprised by how many people uh, you will get a response from. Yeah, the only thing I'll add That's on great to hear. I've certainly heard. D &D, uh, there's an official D&D &D Discord uh, channel uh, that I've, I've seen yes. a lot of people trying to meet up uh, and find games to play virtually. Uh, and uh, we, you know, that's a really great service for, for as Shelly said, finding like-minded people, uh, not necessarily even just ones who want to play Dungeons & Dragons, but who want to play the specific style and uh, way of playing. There's a learn to play uh, a channel on there too. So if you're looking for an online community that's safe, that's moderated, uh, that's uh, a really great way to start. That's great. And we have almost run out of time here. So I'm going to put you both on the spot now, if you don't mind. Starting, starting with Greg, what are your three uh, most recommended characteristics to make a good dungeon master? Wow. So Dungeon Master, I would say uh, listening is actually uh, the number one thing. Uh, you want to, uh, of course, communicate and get your, your uh, setting across to your players, but being able to hear them and, and see what type of uh, thing they want to play is, is, is tantamount. It's very, very important. Uh-oh. Uh, uh, oh, I, I think we've lost Chevy say, there. I was going to say, well, maybe I can move a little bit this way, so at least I'm in there. Oh, there, there we are. That's better. Uh, I will also say that uh, you need to have uh, organizational skills, uh, not necessarily about, you know, making sure, uh, you know, everything's organized, but just be being able to uh, get people together for a session and kind of consistently communicate like, okay, we're gonna be playing at this time. Uh, and uh, this is the type of things that we're gonna be playing is a really great uh, attribute for a dungeon master. And then of course, creativity, you know, uh, there's always fun things that you uh, can improvise along the way in order to um, uh, you know supplement the story even if you're going from a published adventure or something that Dungeons and Dragons uh, has put out there you know you're always going to be able to be uh, making stuff up and adding your own personal flair to it so uh, yeah those those three qualities will make a great dungeon master okay that is great well i'm afraid our time is up we have some more questions maybe we'll see if we can put them out on social media and you guys can uh, give some answers to us um so it only falls to me to um thank you and shelly although unfortunately uh, she's dropped out there <laughs> but thank you very much i do hope this isn't the last time we talk about dungeons and dragons on scout events and it, i'm really looking forward to the partnership uh, that we have between the two organi organizations so thank you very much and uh, hope you have a good evening you too. I'm so excited for more people to get into D and D, and thank you to the scouts and to you for for being here for it. Thank you. Oh, oh sure, perfect. Back. <laughs> I'm back. I'm back just in time to say goodbye. Sorry, three people using the internet. Perfect. It goes. <laughs> well, thank you very well, much, Shelley, and goodbye to both of you. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Bye. Hey. Let's see here. Nope, everybody can hear me. My name is Chris Lindsay, and I am the product manager for Dungeons and Dragons at Wizards of the Coast. And I am joined by my four scout players here today. We're gonna have a really, really good time. Um, and I'm gonna give each of them an opportunity to introduce themselves and their characters. Uh, we will go ahead and start. Uh, let's go ahead and go in alphabetical order. We'll start with Ben. My character is a Lightfoot Halfling who um, is, who has a black bushy hair and is good at sneak attacks. Nice. Um, and Joseph? Yeah, hi, I'm Joseph. My character is a, is Rainwald uh, Dawnbringer. Uh, I'm a paladin. Uh, and I'm wearing sort of like a robe with a with a medallion with with a holy symbol around my neck. Um, I'm about six foot and I'm human. Um, and I've got a javelin long sword um, on my side and back. Excellent. And Olivia, why don't you introduce your character? My character is a woodland elf ranger, um, and it's a short woodland elf with long ginger hair and a green dr long dress and a purple long cloak. 
Nice. And Tessa. Okay, so my character's name is Lilo Treefish. It's a high elf. Uh, it used to be in the Marines. It's got very little battle scars, so it's not been in very many battles, but it's uh, pretty tall. Excellent, excellent. So we'll go ahead and begin our game and, and hopefully everybody will join along for the ride here. Um, you four uh, together have been brought to an elderly woman in town. She's an apothecary. She's quite friendly to everybody she meets. Her name is Tabitha Blackmore. Um, and she's very fond of the peppermint candies she makes to share with those she greets as she goes about her day. Uh, Miss Tabitha, as she's fond of being called, is a rather large ginger cat named Carrot. Carrot accompanies her as she strolls to and from her appointments, and he's rather fond of the dried fish treats she feeds him throughout their day. Unfortunately, Carrot has gone missing, and Miss Tabitha is positively beside herself with worry. She'd be very grateful if you four could find Carrot. She's concerned that he's wandered into the nearby haunted wood and has lost his way. Could you please, please, please find my cat? Her name is, or his name is Carrots, and, and he's, sometimes, sometimes he longingly looks out into the trees of the woods, and I'm hoping that you can find him for me. Um, he's, he's about this big, and he's orange with orange stripes. He's got large green eyes. Um, Go ahead and unmute yourselves <laughs> and stay unmuted for the entire game. <laughs> so, will you please find my cat for me? Hello, can any of you speak? Why, of course, uh, Miss. Miss, we can help you find your uh, cat. Um, oh, excellent, excellent. Where did you, you last see said cat? Well, he was here with me in my in my cottage, you see, and he was playing about in the daffodils just outside the back door here. Right. Very nice. Um, Is you, there any look specific at the, the, place that it might have gone to? Well, yes, he might have gone to those woods, and as, as you look out the back door of her place, you see there is a patch of daffodils and other garden areas that she has set up, um, and uh, the uh, she's got a fence, which the gate has been left open, um, and you can see it is a straight shot from her backyard to this really dark-looking like batch of trees that are on the other side, about 50 yards away. How what would you like to do? How long has she been missing? Um, I haven't seen her since earlier this morning. I and by her, I mean him. I think we should move to, to said, said bunch of trees and uh, investigate around. Certainly. Maybe look for some footprints from the cat. Well, he's, he's, he is rather large, and so he doesn't move about as deftly as other cats do, so footprints are definitely a possibility. So if your cat's rather large, it wouldn't have gone very far because maybe it doesn't walk very fast? Uh, it's hard to say. It's been at least a couple of hours. Would it come if you called him? I've tried that. I've been doing that for the last hour and he has not showed up yet. Thank you for asking though. So, and then uh, she leads you to the gate and uh, and gives you you know, free reign to head out to the to the woods, if you will. As you you wander that direction, uh, uh, would let's see here, who would like to look for tracks? Uh, 
Any uh, of you? Yeah, I'll look Anybody? for tracks. Okay. Um, then what I want you to do, Joseph, is I want you to make a survival check. You'll take your your die, your, your die 20, and you'll roll that, and you'll see on your list of skills on your character sheet toward the bottom, there is a skill called survival. Uh, so roll the d20 and add the bonus to your survival check to the to the roll. Fifteen. Fifteen. Excellent. Um, you do in fact see places where um, uh, branches have been broken and uh, twigs have been snapped, and you even see on one little briar a tuft of orange fur. Uh, as you walk along, uh, and it seems as though Carrot has left a very clear path of destruction as the, uh, the, the, the rotund cat moved its way through the woods, uh, and deeper into the darkness he went. But of course, cats have very good sight, so he paid no attention to that. What would you guys like to do? I think we should maybe all walk together through the woods and uh, carry on looking for more tracks to see possible directions that the cat might have gone into yeah let's walk let's walk let's walk through the forest uh through the deeper into the forest where following uh the uh, said cat's uh trail excellent excellent so as you walk through the forest who is going to walk in front? I will. Okay. So our stout halfling will move forward to the front. Who is going to be behind him? I'll go behind. All right. So, and then behind them. Okay. Okay. And that leaves Joseph bringing up the rear um, as you guys move through the woods, looking around for the cats, uh, make me, I want all four of you to make me a perception check. Okay, again, roll your d20 and you'll see on your skills, there is a skill called perception. Add the number next to that to your d20 roll and tell that to me. I got a 10. Very good. I got 11. I got 21. Oh, wow. Got nine. How about you? Ne Excellent. Olivia and Tessa, as you're walking through the woods, you both spy through a thicket off to one side. There is a rather large, dark looking cave. And Tessa, you also note little tufts of fur along the thicket uh, on the ground heading in just that direction. Maybe we should start going that way towards yeah. the tracks. <laughs> Excellent. So you head towards the cave and um, as you approach, you can see it is very dark on the inside. Um, a couple of you uh, are elves, and you can see in the dark. The other two are not, though, and you'll probably need a light source. Now, if you look on the second page of your character sheet, you'll see that you have equipment. You probably all have torches. Yes. This seems like an yeah. opportune moment for one of you to, to perhaps light one. Who would like to do that? Sure, I will. Okay. Uh, I takes a uh, rainwolf takes a tor takes his torch out and using the tinderbox he lights the torch up so it, so the cave is now visible. Excellent. So as you enter into the cave, uh, you have a light source and the cave extends into the darkness with the light kind of cascading around you uh, as you leave the world of the light behind. You walk in about fifty meters. When you get to a rather large metal door, okay, um, the door looks rather sinister. 
On it, there are four iron locks. Each lock has a keyhole with a sculpted image above it. Four iron keys hang from hooks on a nearby wall, and each key has a different number of teeth. Above the keys, the following verse has been etched into the wall. The spells on these locks are all the same, though each possesses a unique name. Count on your answer to unlock the way, but use the wrong key to your dismay. And I will show you a picture. Oh, let me get to my... Let's see if that's the right way. That is the wrong way. Okay, we're going to have to speed through. There they are. Rainwolf turns to the group and asks whether someone with a high high ability of lock picking may be able to or high 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 ability of wisdom or with uh, turns to the group and asks whether he they will be able to solve said riddle or pick the locks Roscoe says he has thieves tools to help pick the lock okay so which lock would you like to try and pick there are four locks there is an image above each one um, so we can use those images to identify them. One has the inscribed image of a bat. One has the inscribed image of a snake. One has the inscribed image of a spider. And one has an inscribed image of a wolf. I would like to pick the lock of the lock of, that's below the snake. Okay. What you're going to do then is you're going to make me a dexterity check, okay? So you're going to add uh, your dexterity bonus and your training bonus. But actually, let's just go ahead and make this simple. Add your dexterity bonus. So roll and, and tell me what you with, get. With the d20? Yes, please. 20. Okay. So you um, start fiddling with the lock beneath the snake. Um, and the snake itself um, shifts and moves a little bit as you play with the lock. And as you keep fiddling with the tumblers, they also change and shift and move. And it doesn't seem as though it's going to come unlocked for you. Roscoe Perhaps. says, "Yeah." Roscoe asks the group, "Does anyone else else have any uh, skills in picking locks?" If Roscoe, if you, Ben, if you would like to make a, a, a perception check, be my guest. Can we make a perception check? Roll, roll a d20 and find the bonus under your perception on your character sheet and add that to the d20. 18. Very good. So looking at the keys, you notice that each of them has a different number of teeth on them. Um, you think that perhaps with each one being different, if you put the right key in the right hole, you might be able to get the door to come open. Um, in the first line of the puzzle, it says the spells on these locks are all the same. 
What do you suppose that means? That the one key works for all locks, maybe. Hmm. No, but it says though each possesses a unique name. So each one has a unique key. And you see that one key has three teeth, one key has four teeth, one key has five, and one has six. Ryan Wald suggests to uh, Rocco that what if the keys uh, each represented the amount of uh, legs each animal had? So the spider key would have six, would be the six teeth one. The wolf would be the four, the four, the four teeth one, and the snake would be I don't know the other ones, uh, and uh, the other animal would be the other the other key that I just didn't say. Roscoe thanks him and says, "Ah, oh, well done. Let's try them now." If you like, which one would you like to try first? The three teeth one for the snake. Okay, so when you take the three teeth key and you put it in the lock beneath the image of the snake and turn it, there is a little zap, like really bad static electricity shocking you and you take one point of damage that doesn't seem to be quite right i don't think that's the right key then what are the other animals sorry the animals are a bat a snake a spider and a wolf So does every time we try, we lose health? Oh, it's possible. You have only tried it once though, so. Um, I think we should just give it another go and see what happens, personally. Per perhaps, perhaps there's another theory you might, you might attempt. You look like you're thinking you're working something out, Olivia. Did you have an idea? Yeah. What's that? Maybe that the four forty is the um wolf because a wolf has four legs. A wolf has letters. four legs. Yes. Letters. Sorry, letters. Oh, letters. Okay. Um, okay, so do you want to put the key with the four teeth in, in the wolf? Yeah. Okay, so you take the key with the four teeth and you put it in beneath the lock, in the lock, beneath the, the image of the wolf. And you turn it and there is a clicking sound. And that's it. Yeah. Um, maybe the five teeth key is the snake one because snake has five letters in it. Okay. And when you do that, you put the key in the lock with the image of the snake and you turn it and there is another clicking sound. Um, the three teeth key might be the bat because bat has three letters. Okay. And again, you take that and you put it in the lock and you turn it and there is a clicking sound. Which means the six teeth key must be the spider because the spider has six letters. Yes. And you put that in there and when you turn it, there is a large ratcheting sound as the locks come undone and the door props open just a little bit. Well done. 
Roscoe says, why don't we go in and take a look? Okay. Who's opening the door? I open the door, seeing there's a big heavy metal door. Um, yeah. Okay, so you swing the door open. For such a heavy metal door, and for the amount of rust that you see on the outside, it's odd that the door does, in fact, swing open um, quite readily uh, with no, no sound of screeching at all on the hinges. Um, beyond the metal door, there is a large open cave through um, a hole uh, above, lets some light into the cave. Uh, and you can see that there's this massive, massive forest of mushrooms that fill this cave. And in the middle of the cave is a pond. And if you can see the image there, you will see that there is a, a grid overlaid. So just so that you have some sort of frame of reference, each one of those squares represents five feet. Or if it's easier, two meters. The direction you come in from is this one right here. Can you see my 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 pointer right here? Yes. I move twenty feet to uh, in line with the big mushroom at the end of that curve. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so you come into the room twenty feet, and you're looking around, and you see these mushrooms. They're massive. The mushrooms that you see on the screen, some stand 10, 12 feet tall. Um, and uh, the whole place smells very earthy. Uh, definitely ideal for very, very large mushrooms to grow. Um, somewhere nearby, uh, you hear a rustling in the cave. I use divine sense to sense what's around within 60 foot of me. Okay, well, what does that do? Uh, you can detect good or evil until the end of your next turn. You can sense anything affected by a hallow spell or know in any location of celestial fiend undead within 60 feet. This is not behind total cover. You can use this feature three times per long rest. Okay, so you stretch out with your divine sense uh, and the rest of you, you can see. What does it look like, Joseph, when you use your divine sense? Uh, when I use my divine sense, I see all... I see... Um, the uh, spores coming off the mushrooms and I feel the the, the earthly nature of it and the whole well, what do others see that. when they when you use your divine sense um, when they they, they also see um, a, a, in the distance sort of like a an orange sense of a cat okay so you see him stretching out with his with his ability to sense these odd things now um, you don't sense any undead. Or, or fiends or anything of that sort of thing um, in the area. Um, you do see the spores coming off of the mushrooms and make a perception check, why don't you? Roll that d20 and add your bonus from your perception skill. Uh, 16. Excellent. Um, and you can also see that the mushrooms have little tiny needles all over their surface. So that, that's going to mean that we don't want to go near them because they might hurt us and potentially could have hurt the cat if it's in there. It is certainly possible. So what would you, what would the rest of you like to do? Tessa, what would you like to do? Well, if we was to go towards the, um, the big lake thing in the middle. Yeah. Maybe look around the, the edge. But Certainly. I don't think it'll be the best of ideas if we split apart. I think it's better if we was to stay closer together. So if anything happens or if we find the cat, we'll all be together and we won't get lost. Especially for the people who can't see. Okay. So does everybody want to go to the pond? Yes. Yep. Okay. Good, so you head in the direction of the pond. And it's a very good idea. Um, Olivia, uh, you're a ranger. Um, 
Why don't you uh, uh, make a uh, a nature check? Roll the d20 and add the bonus from your nature skill to it. Twenty-two. Okay, that's very good. Um, you definitely know that animals frequently. Um, uh, are drawn to water because everything needs water to live. So this is a good plan. Um, and you also know that it is possible that the little needles on the mushrooms might be some kind of a defense mechanism that those plants have, okay? Um, so it might be, might be a good idea to be cautious around them. Um, as the group heads across uh, the cavern toward the pond, um, I want everybody to make me a perception check. Roll your d20 and add the bonus from your perception skill. I got 20. I got nice. 15. Seven. I got 90. Seven? Okay. So, um, Nearby, um, with a, see, I heard 20, and I heard 7, and I heard, what did you get, Ben? I'm sorry. Uh, I got 19. 19, and Joseph, what did you get? Uh, I got 14. 14? So, um, with the 7, uh, you spot um, across the other side of the pond, uh sitting lazily on top of one of the mushrooms, the smaller mushrooms, is a large orange cat. He's licking his paws and just sort of resting there. Um, uh, and that's uh, uh, with a 14, jo uh, Joseph, um, you note that there um, are many, 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 many small mushrooms growing around the edge of the pond. And as you get closer, they tend to shift a little bit as if there were a wind, but there's no wind and mushrooms don't move anyways. How strange. Um, with a 19 and a 20, you both um, notice a dark shadow in the lake, in the water. What do you do? So did we say the cat's ginger? Yes, yes it is. So there's a very, very high chance that that dark thing in the middle of the lake is not our cat that we are looking for. Just- It is not. No, you, 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 those of you, um, Everybody can see uh, the large ginger cat sitting on the smaller mushroom across on the opposite side of the pond. Roscoe. Hmm. Roscoe uses his sneak attack to find out what it, what the animal is and deal some damage to it. Okay, well, you can't use your sneak attack just yet, but what you can do, Roscoe, is you can um, sneak forward and investigate. So why don't you start by making me a stealth check, roll a d20 and add the bonus from your stealth skill to that. 20. Oh, very good. And um, now go ahead and do the same thing, only with your investigation skill. What happens when I roll the, like, was it a duck, maybe? A duck? Oh, 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 are you talking about, let's see here. So that's all Does similar. it look like this? Yeah. Wait, wait. This thing right here? Yeah. That, that's an ampersand, that stands for 20. That's very high. So 26. Okay, so you start to investigate and you can see that in the water, there is an orb 
some kind of strange orb and it shifts and moves uh, in the water. Um, and you are approaching very quietly uh, and the orb, which moves kind of like a creature, um, doesn't seem to notice you yet. Maybe continue having a look. Okay, and, so you, you, go ahead. And getting up close, look at what it is. All right, so you walk right up to the edge of the water. As you're walking through the small mushrooms, um, you feel little stings on your skin. And what I need you to do is I need you to roll what we call a saving throw. In this case, it's a constitution saving throw. You will see um, on your yeah. character sheet next to your ability scores where it says saving throws. Yeah. Okay, so roll the d20 and add the bonus from your constitution saving throw to that. 14. Okay, very good. Um, so you feel a little, little stings on your skin. Um, and for a moment, you... Um, feel like like the muscles in your body are starting to kind of lock up, but you kind of push your way through that that feeling and manage to throw it off. Um, uh, the rest of you notice uh, Roscoe kind of like um, almost stumble a little bit as this happens. So you you see that something has occurred as he's gotten closer to the water of the pond. What do the rest of you want to do? I stay further away so the orb doesn't notice me as I am quite as I am quite heavy footed, and I'm not okay. particularly good at uh, stealth. All right, so you're staying back, uh, Olivia. What would you like to do? I don't really know. What does dexterity mean? Dexterity is how uh, nimble you are, or how. Um, uh, quick your reflexes are. Okay. So did you want to get closer, Olivia, or did you want to move around the lake toward the cat, or what did you want to do? I think I'd try and move around the lake toward the cat. Okay. Would you like to go to the right or the left? The right. Okay, to the right. All right, so you start moving around the right toward the cat. Um, and what about you, Tessa? What would you like to do? I think I'm going to go with Olivia, so that if anything happens, I can help. Or Excellent. Something, so there's not just one of us. Very good. So you two start heading around the right side of the lake, or the pond, toward the cat. Um, ben, you're looking into the water. Um, Joseph is staying back. Um, as you're moving around the lake, there's a spook from the water as a creature, an ugly, ugly, round creature emerges from the water of the lake. And it casually looks around. And when it does so, it doesn't notice Roscoe right near it, but it does notice Joseph standing back a ways. It looks a lot like this. It is green and scaly, and it has a one large eye in the middle of its head and a large gaping maw. There are four stubby tentacles attached to the top of its, top of its head, and on each one of those tentacles, there is an eye as well. Um, it is about the size of a volleyball. And as it looks around, it, like I said, it sees the paladin standing back and it uh, snarls its disapproval. Um, it doesn't seem to have any form of intelligent speech whatsoever. And it starts floating in your general direction, Joseph. Um, it looks hostile. What would you like to do? I aim my, uh, I aim my, I aim my javelin at the at said creature. Okay. And so now throw. you pull a weapon out and start to aim at it. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to roll initiative. On your character sheet in the top middle next to your, where it says armor class, there's another di another bonus there that says initiative. Yes? Uh, oh, yeah. Or the top, in the middle. Okay. And so roll your d20, and I want you to add that number to the roll, and I want you to tell it to me, and I'm going to write it down. 16. Okay. And everybody else, go ahead and do the same. Fifteen. Okay, Olivia gets sixteen as well. Fifteen. Did you say fifteen, Ben? Yeah, fifteen. Okay, and Tessa? Seven. <laughs> okay, that's okay. That just means your 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 plan is well thought out. Um. Ooh. Okay, so. Um, this creature starts heading uh, with what almost looks like uh, uh, evil intent toward toward Ben, or not Ben, uh, toward Joseph. Uh, Joseph, go ahead and make your attack roll with your um, with your javelin. The way you do that is you'll see on your character sheet there's a the bar there in the middle towards the towards the bottom. And it'll say javelin, and then it'll say to hit, and there'll be a bonus number there. Roll yep. your d20 and add the bonus to that, and tell me what you got. Oh, well, next to it, it says 1d6 plus 3. Is that so? They add, oh, I need to add the. Oh, we need to add the plus that, 5. Okay. Don't, don't worry about that right now. So I need just to add the, the plus just 5. The, yeah, just the plus 5. Yep. Yeah. Uh, 17. 17. So your javelin flies true as you throw it through the air and it streaks towards this creature, um, hitting it. Um, now you can roll that 1d6 plus 3. The d6 is the little square die. And uh, uh, tell me what that number is. That's a 4. Okay. So you will do 4. Do do plus a 3? Yep. Uh, 7. Oh, so seven. Good. You'll do seven points of damage. So you can see a, a strange green ichor issues from this creature uh, as you strike it with your javelin. Um, uh, at this point, the creature... Beams of energy come from two of those eye stalks that it has on its head. Um, one will come directly toward you, Joseph, and uh, I want you to roll a dexterity saving throw. So find that box next to your ability scores that says saving throws on it. Uh, senses, uh, skills. Go above Sorry, skills. Uh, above skills. Oh, saving throws, yep. Saving um, throws. Okay, there you go. Good. Yep. Um, one dexterity. of them is dexterity. Yep. Roll the d20 and add that bonus to the dice. 11. 11. Okay, that is unfortunate. Um, so the beam hits you and it's really cold and you will take five points of cold damage. Right. When it hits you. And let's see here. The other beam is going to go at Olivia. Olivia, I want you to make a wisdom saving throw. So that same little box that says saving throws and add a roll a d20 and add the wisdom bonus. 19. Okay, so that beam strikes you, and uh, you feel your head get just a little bit fuzzy for a moment, um, and uh, but you shake off that confusion because you're really focused on getting to Carrot, okay? Now, Olivia, it is your turn. What would you like to do?
So some possibilities are you can continue moving towards Carrot. You could uh, fire your bow at the strange orb creature. Um, I think I'm going to fire my bow. OK, very good. Um, so on your character sheet, there is a uh, under the weapons there, in that little thing, there, one of the things says uh, longbow, and then there's a bonus. Roll your d20 and add the bonus. Twelve. Okay, twelve. So you fire your bow and the arrow flies through the air and the thing having been struck already by the javelin is very wary now being struck again and it, and it dodges just a little bit out of the way and you just miss, unfortunately. Okay, um, and uh, let's see here. Now, Ben, it is your turn. The creature has not noticed you there and it is within reach. What I would you like would to like, do? I would like to use my short short sword to attack it. Excellent. So uh, because it doesn't notice you, you have what we call advantage. What that means is instead of rolling one of the d20s, I want you to roll two. And I only want you to use the number from the one that rolls higher. Yeah. And add that to your attack bonus. Twenty-one. Excellent. You strike out with your short sword and you stab at the creature. Now, because the creature didn't know you were there, you can use your sneak attack. So you're going to roll the damage for your weapon, which is right there next to that bonus. It should be like 1d6. Yeah. Plus 3. Do I, do I roll a d6 now? So you'll roll 1d6 and you'll uh, roll an additional 2d6 for your sneak attack. Okay. Okay, so you're gonna roll 3d6 plus the number. Okay, six, three, four. And add them all up. Uh, 13. Okay, and then is there a bonus on your, on your damage roll? Is that the plus three? Yes. Plus three piercing. So, so, so 17. No, seven, okay. 16. 16. So um, you stab forward uh, straight up into the creature, and there's a popping sound as the creature whizzes in the air and then flies back down into the water. And that's where we're going to stop the combat because the creature appears to be to have gone away at this point. Now, but but still, it is Tessa's turn. Tessa, what would you like to do? There's nothing there to attack at this point. Uh, carry on walking towards the cat. Okay. Tessa, why don't you roll an animal handling check for me? Roll a d20 and add your bonus from your animal handling skill. 19. Very good. The cat carrot likes you very much and as you approach uh he stands up where he is on top of the mushroom and he stretches his body like a cat does and he licks his paw one last time before hopping off and prancing in your direction um, he will lean his paws up against the armor on your leg and ask essentially which is his way of asking to be picked up I think we should pick him up. I'll pick him up. All right. So you pick him up, and he just sort of curls into your arms at that point. And then me and Olivia are still away from everyone else. Yes. So I think we should start making our way back around the pond. Excellent. And back to the other two. Good. So you, as a group, head back away from the pond. Um, and and you can return now with Carrot to uh, uh, to Miss um, Blackmore. Uh, and when you get there, 
she is thrilled to see that you have found her cat. Um, and uh, she's like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And she gives each one of you a small handful of the tiny mints that she makes. Um, and uh, she takes Carrot and throws him over his, her shoulder. Um, and as she's walking away, you can see the cat looking at the party and you could swear he winks. But then she's gone. And that, I believe, is where we're going to end our adventure today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what happens next. There are people controlling all of them, the, the streams here. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>